You're listening to the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. In today's publishing landscape, you can reach fans all over the world. Query letters are a thing of the past. You don't even need a literary agent. There is nothing standing in the way of making a living from writing. Join two best-selling authors who have self-published more than 20 books between them. Now, on to the show with your hosts, Autumn Burt and Jasper Schmidt. Hello, I'm Autumn. Today, Jesper is away, and we're giving him a bit of a vacation, and instead, I have with me Stephen Hodges. So Stephen is here, and you wear several different hats, which is really exciting. There's so many things I think we could talk about that we're going to have a fun trying to keep this on topic, but I know one of those is that you're an award-winning children's fantasy author with your series, The Magic Poof, which... I love, I will link to the website because I love the images and the diversity of characters. It's a mom's choice award. It is adorable. And I love the diversity of it. It's so sweet. And you also work in Hollywood production. And I, like I mentioned before we started, I'm going to get this totally wrong. I ran into you because you're a LA film scout helping out the page Turner awards hosted by book lover. So I'll let you wrap that side of your life up if you would. Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't know. I think the page Turner awards when they put the name LA film scout on there, I find that, (laughs) I find that funny because it makes me seem like I'm in a forest full of, you know, LA people, you know, scouting out things in a pith helmet. But uh, really, really, uh, my job is is that I, uh, you know, I'm a producer and I've worked in the film industry for quite some time, film and television. And uh, I also develop projects. So it's basically it's more of a development and I have my own company. And so development is essentially uh, finding stuff that not only I create, but that others create and hopefully turn it into television and film so when they say la film scout i always think of you know uh, it, like an old movie or something like that but really i'm just someone who uh, uh likes to read other people's stuff and likes to uh put people together so that's uh mainly my job um as well as um production stuff and everything in between because in this industry um you have to be pretty diverse in order to uh, figure out the whys and wherefores of how it works. Um, and then, yes, of course, uh, working on the uh, my book series, and I'm in the process of pitching it right now for, as an animated series. So, um, yes, lots of different hats, um, although I don't wear actual hats because I'm not that hipster. But, you know, in L.A., we do have sunshine, so we, I do put on plenty of sunblock. So, yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, I like that image. It's just, and as I mentioned before we begin, I'm over here on the East Coast. Jesper's in Denmark. So this is a whole different sphere. As much as I've driven by Hollywood, um, I don't think I've gone, I went through it once when I was maybe a young teenager. So this is a whole, it's like an author saying, oh, I've only done this and this and this. And to anyone listening, they're like, really? That's just, that's a ton. So from sure, an outside perspective, you, you know, the things you have listed, Listed on your LinkedIn bio and even on your Magic Poof bio. I mean, you've worked in the Matrix. You've done all these things. So that's just so cool. I, I'm so grateful that you took the time to talk with us today. Sure, of course, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the Matrix was. Uh, I actually started out in the industry. Um, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona originally, um, and at wanting to do all this after graduating from college. Uh, with no connections, actually ended up starting my own film company uh, oh my gosh. with uh, a mentor who was, um, when I went to school, I did an internship at a local television station here uh, and started working with a guy who was working on his first film. And uh, instead of going straight to Hollywood, we started our own production company instead. Because oh my why be a PA when you can be a vice president right out of college? Oh, um, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah, so we did that for a while. Um, but then I also had to get a job. So ended up uh, training and becoming a, uh, a video engineer. So um, working in editing and live production. Uh, and that was my quote unquote waitress job. So the cool thing about me is that I actually know every side of production and can pretty much do everybody's jobs. Uh, so on the matrix, I actually was a video engineer, which was oh. a really fun experience and always fun to, you know, be um, taking lunch break and sitting on the set. uh, And then all of a sudden Keanu Reeves comes and sits next to you because he happened to be in the same place. And he's just a really nice guy, actually. So that was interesting. So yeah, it was a, it was a very fun experience, but very, very uh, uh, 
it was huge. Like it was just like, you don't get how much stuff is going on. And usually you're in a bubble, uh, you know, on one set of production crews, but uh, that was a really fun experience. That sounds so amazing. And yeah, Keanu, he always has seemed like a real earth down to kind of guy. If I had to choose someone in Hollywood, I, I think he would be on my top five list of people I wouldn't mind running into because he seems like a real person. So that's kind of less intimidating. Yeah, yeah no, he is actually a really cool guy. He's just super, super laid back. Just a really, really nice guy. Yeah. Well, that's Awesome. And like I said, I think you're, I want to talk a little bit about diversity in fantasy, but I also want to talk about, you know, is really, I mean, I see this a lot more. I saw the Page Turner Awards. I've seen a recent podcast. I think I got an email somewhere like all within the last year, maybe we're all just cooped up. And so we're all thinking of, you know, fantasy and cinema and Game of Thrones. And so everyone's sitting at home going, I could do that too. So it seems like there's this idea and this energy about pitching stories to Hollywood. So this, is this really a thing? Do you think there's an uptick in people being interested or an uptick in even Hollywood considering this for people? Um, I mean, I think it, it's always been there. I think that there's, uh, now, especially with the, a boatload of streaming services and niche programming Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, influencers on the internet and TikTok and all of those different things. I, I think that there's a, um, there's a bitter, there's a, people are starting to believe that there's not all of these gatekeepers, right? And there still are gatekeepers. And I actually am someone who has a mixed uh, feeling about gatekeepers themselves, because I honestly think that you need them uh, to a certain extent. But I also have run into a great deal of gatekeepers who don't know what they're doing. Um, oh. So it's one of those things where it's a difficult process to try and parse out um, what's what's needed and not. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to do things, but at the same time, the um, the audience is a lot more fragmented. So mm-hmm. the idea that you're going to uh, write something and it will immediately become Game of Thrones uh, is that's a complete misnomer. That's um, very, that's that's the you know the trifecta. That's you know. Uh, you know, somebody came down and sprinkled some fairy dust on you, along with, you know, talent, hard work and being in the right place at the right time. Um, but I do think that people have a lot more opportunity to do their own thing. Um, there is a lot of self-publishing. Uh, there's a lot of people who I self-publish my books because um, uh, I dealt with publishers for about a year and a half. Um, and I actually pitched my series at Nickelodeon before I even had the books because um, I came oh, up with wow. the idea. Um, but I, um, I realized that uh, the publishing industry is changing. Um, and it's, to be honest with you, in my opinion, the publishing industry is kind of dead. Uh, mm. the, 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 the big publishers are really, um, they, they base their model now really off of tentpole properties, which is similar to what's happening in movies with things like okay. Marvel and stuff like that. And because of that, um, there's a lot less space uh, for smaller people to be successful if you term success as lots of people read your book and you make money. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, but I do think that there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's also as difficult um, to get yourself known just because there is so much more, you know, uh, there's so much more going on in the business. And actually you had mentioned the page Turner awards. And that's one thing I like about them is that they're kind of small and they're the ones who approached me originally uh, to, um, to to judge their awards um but they seem to have a better opportunity for smaller for smaller people just because they're a smaller outfit and they're also based in london whereas the u.s Mm -hmm. is just an extremely hard market to get in but um i think if you're you know if you persevere and you know the industry and you do all this stuff and you work hard uh do everything for you uh mainly Mm -hmm. do it for you and then hope and then also you know, look for your audience and that can take you a lot of places in a lot of different ways. And a lot of it is just, um, I, I don't want to say it's luck because I don't really believe in luck. I believe that things happen for a reason. So I think things will happen for you for a reason if you're in the right headspace. Oh, I like the sound of that though. So it's not impossible. And 
I agree. It's like I had originally thought of like the trying to sell your script to Hollywood or even one of the Netflix or HBO. It's sort of like, you know, trying to pitch to these brick and mortar publishers. You there are still gatekeepers. You need to know the manuscript and how they look at it and what you need to do before you get there if you want to have any chance of success. I mean, the idea of just sending it off to somebody and they're going to fall in love with it. And the next thing you know, you're going to be the next George R. R. Martin, ignoring the fact that he had 30, 40 years of experience before getting to Game of Thrones. And he'd been writing it for how many years? I think it's like seven years for each book. So he's yeah, been exactly. really working on yeah. this a long time. His overnight yeah. success story is about 40 years long. <laughs> yeah, his overnight success story is George R.R. R. Martin. You know, if he were a normal person, he'd be retired right now. But, yes. he's, you know, so they're they're just now working on the... Uh, they just went into uh, development and pre-production on the on the prequel series for Game of Thrones, which I think is about the House Targaryen. And mm-hmm. um, but you know now all of that is you know, because of COVID, all of uh, all of production is shut down. But that's a, it's a massive endeavor, um, and they never would have taken something like that on when they first you know when they first came up with uh, Game of Thrones. Obviously, HBO has money, uh, but if you watch the first episode of Game of Thrones or even the first season. And you look at the amount of effects used, or if you take a look at where it was shot, um, you know, Northern Ireland and places like that, um, places that have production incentives, they didn't spend nearly as much money as you think they did. Not that they didn't spend a lot of money in our terms, but um, look at that compared to, say, the last season where they're just throwing money left and right. You know, there's, there's you know, boatloads of, you know, the, the dragons are killing, you know, the dragons are yeah. killing it, you know, oh taking it on the wall yeah. and all that stuff. But if you if you actually watch the you know, the first season, you can tell that the budget, you know, pretty much tripled or quadrupled between the first season and the last season, only because it was a hit. If it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't a hit, and people didn't resonate with it, um, and HBO had not pushed it, uh, it would have very easily gone, you know, uh, gone away uh, pretty quickly. And, uh, and I think that could even be said with something like the Harry, even though Harry Potter, for example, was a great success as a book. If you watch the first movie versus the last movie, First movie is actually quite, um, it's a little rough and uh, mm. it's a little, um, it's, it's a little choppy. Uh, it's a, it's still a great movie, but they didn't know how big of a success it would be. And then you can see the progression of not only budget, but also um, the willingness to put in more, um, more behind the scenes from a, from a technical standpoint and also from a, from a talent standpoint. Yeah, I have noticed that. Maybe I don't think I really noticed it with Harry Potter and Game of Thrones, but I was a huge Supernatural fan, and I recently, for whatever reason, watched like the first series again. And then you compare that even to the graphics and just the effects of the last um, what was it, fifteen. I can't remember what which one they hit fourteen, fifteen se- uh, in a row seasons, and it was just like, wow, this change. A heck of a lot, and not just because the actors aged fifteen years. But... Absolutely, absolutely, and you can you can see that in something like one of my favorites because I am a geek is the Mandalorian. Um, you oh, know, and if yeah. you take a look at that, and just you go on Disney Plus and watch Mandalorian and see uh, the the amount of uh, the amount of effort that's put in, um, specifically with like set, set extensions in. Um, ch- check out the documentaries on the Mandalorian and just be amazed at what they do technologically. Um, to create uh, non green screen environments, you know, but with advances in technology and uh, um, in in video walls and LED walls and that type of thing, uh, it's pretty amazing. But even if you look at the Mandalorian, the, one of the things that I like about it is is that it's 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 an epic Star Wars movie, but yet in reality, it's much smaller. Uh, that I think the story is better served by um, less expansiveness and more telling the story of the character in sort of tighter environments. Um, Mm. And you get the expansiveness of star Wars without necessarily it having to be a gigantic movie. Um, And that I think people have seen now the difference between what you can do specifically on uh, something like a television series versus um, star Wars, uh, the the latest, um, the sequels, the end sequels, Mm -hmm. which I actually really enjoyed. Um, but the Mandalorian is something very different and they go into it with a very specific storytelling style about this character, as opposed to, we have to, you know, encompass this massive universe as opposed to, they bring in small elements that fans know. And that's part of the reason why it's popular is because, oh, I saw that, 
you know, thing or whatever it is in, uh, okay. you know, an object or something like that in the original Star Wars film, which you knew it was a complete throwaway because it was a prop that somebody made for a scene. And then, you know, John Favreau will bring it into uh, the Mandalorian and you'll be like, oh my gosh, that's one of those things, you know, and, 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 and you know, in real life, it's actually an ice maker, but in, in the, uh, you know, in the Mandalorian, it's a, it's an actual, uh, or it's an ice cream maker. Uh, anyway, sorry, I can geek out about that show. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. Okay, Please awesome. continue. That's okay. That's, it's so interesting. And actually, that's a really good point is so if you're thinking that, you know, this is something that you just really, it's going to be something that's on your bucket list, so you're going to go for it. Should you think as a writer a about the scope and scale of your story that if you do want it to have it, you know, pitch it to have it sc- turned into a movie or a series like epic fantasy, like we were saying, and even science fiction, these have a lot of elements and magic. This is CG effects. Uh, do you want to try to minimize that? Would it, would that make any difference if, you know, as something you could look at and say, Oh, you know what? We can come up with this and keep the budget low. Or you're looking at sure. 20 dragons and all this other stuff. And you're like, no, just no. Yeah. Like that's probably going to be, that's about $20 million, $20 million <laughs> dragon per episode. Um, oh, I, think that, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, necessarily, I don't think it's necessary to do either. Uh, what I do think is that your you know, your vision of your story is your story, uh, but something on a printed page, um, books are written very differently than screenplays. Um, mm-hmm. The screenplays are always about showing, not telling. In books, you can have a lot of background, a lot of dialogue, a lot of, uh, you can even, you know, you can have uh, narration, you can have, an, you know, an overarching narrator, or if you're you're doing it in first person voice. Um, but mm-hmm. I, my thought process is, is if you're going to write something like that, write it the way you want it, but also with an eye towards what the visuals would be. And then with regards to the scope, um, I think the scope is unlimited in books, but I think it's important for you to understand if you truly want to turn this into a television series or a movie, that the vision that you have in your book is going to be um, radically different or very different than what you would normally expect um, to see on screen simply because of budgets and that type of thing. So in other words, uh, they always say, don't be afraid to kill your children, I believe is a term uh, in screenwriting. And that basically applies as well in, in the sense that if you've got this really awesome, you know, epic scene with, you know, 30 dragons and a, you know, and a guy and a sword and a guy and a sword and, you know, and whatever you have going on, um, chances are good. That'll probably be cut down. Um, mm. The fun thing about filmmaking versus writing is, is that, uh, with limitations, you have a much, you have an opportunity to um, create story based on those limitations, and sometimes that's much more fun. Uh, right. If you if you're limited and you say, "Hey, I want to shoot a dragon," you know, uh, I want to shoot a dragon blowing up a wall, and they're like, "Well, you can't really do that." How do you tell the story with the characters without? that element. In other words, that's a set piece, but that's not character. So how do you do that? Um, One of the things I think they did really well in Game of Thrones, uh, for the most part, was they created the dragons as characters. But really, the the reason that they're sold that way is because they are a, um, they're an extension of Daenerys Targaryen's personality, right? So in other words, they're not really dragons. They're, they're not pets, they're their own thing. But they're really based on her personality and specifically on Amelia Clark's acting as to how she treats them. Um, right. And, you know, a good rule of thumb is uh, of that is if you just go back to literally Star Wars and um, The Empire Strikes Back. And one of the things that, you know, Yoda doesn't work unless Mark Hamill is a really good actor because he's basically acting like a, with a puppet. And you don't believe that Yoda's <sighs> alive until Mark Hamill, as the actor, gives you permission. Uh, to okay. believe that he is. So if you actually watch those scenes, you can see that he's acting uh, opposite a puppet. And even though Frank Oz is amazing, it's still a puppet, you know? Uh-huh. And so it's one of those things where you have to, if you're thinking things from a filmmaking standpoint, you have to visually understand that if you create an orc or a character or whatever it is, even if that character is, even if that character is relatively minor, there's still an extension of, the skill set of the person who is acting opposite of them, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes sense. And it's, it's one of those, 
you know, it's the combination of the script and the actor and eventually the CGI effects. And it's all of these things together that really make it come alive. And that's what's kind of cool. And it's what I like even about writing. It's not just the author, it's how the reader takes the author's words and creates their own story in their mind. And it's the combination Mm -hmm. of the two that creates the magic. So it's the same thing with Hollywood, but a little bit different. And you were talking Mm -hmm. though about, you know, the writing. So is it something like, would you have a screenplay in hand or can you just have a book and should it be a best-selling book? Or can you just have so much faith in yourself that you decide you're going to pitch it and I guess maybe write the screenplay? I mean, do you need to do those things? Um, so I guess the answer is yes, uh, to all of those things, <laughs> okay. and no, um, there, there really is no, um, there's no cut and dried sort of method. My thought process is, is if you have a book and you want to, you know, sell it, uh, as a film or, uh, as a film, et cetera, et cetera, um, that you create a really excellent treatment. So in other words, uh, when you write your book, uh, write, first of all, write an amazing book, know your craft. Um, there's a lot of people who say that they're writers and they're not. I'm a children's picture book writer and everybody thinks that, you know, grandma in their basement cranks those out every day. But the bottom line is, is <laughs> there actually are rules and, yeah. um, ways that are written. Uh, you have to understand the rules of publishing, specifically if you want it on paper, um, word count, all of it. So there's just the, the rules. And then there's the actual writing of story. So writing, a, in my case, writing a picture book isn't really writing a book. Writing a picture book is understanding what the pictures are in your mind and understanding what the layout of the book is. And then also creating um, language and feeling that... Uh, equates to what you're trying to do, but also understanding who your audience is. So I don't, uh, so writing a picture book is a little different, um, but know your craft. I mean, I've written, I've done, read a lot of, I can't remember how many books I read mm-hmm. for that uh, screen, uh, the screen Turner award thing. I read the first yeah. chapters of, I want to say over a hundred books, oh um, which I didn't realize that's what I was signing up for at the time. <laughs> so the weekend yeah. before it was due, I was like, Oh, I have to read all of this stuff. And, um, I can tell within the first paragraph whether or not I'm going to read the rest of it. And I had to be pretty draconian uh, about basically going, I don't have time to read all of this stuff. Um, If if you didn't grab me in the first paragraph, I'm not going to read your first chapter. And if I'm not going to read your first chapter, then I'm not going to read your book. So, you know, know your craft and it has to be very loving and very exacting. And it is not an easy thing to do um, for a writer um, and so I get it. I understand that having written books, I understand how difficult it is. Uh, but again, like I said, don't be afraid to kill your children because it really is not just about, unfortunately, the entire book and premise. It's, it's about, it can be about a, just a couple of words and you can agonize over a couple or three words or one sentence or the structure of a character for days. And it could change as you continue to write the book. So, um, but my advice for people who don't necessarily write scripts, because it's a bit of a different writing muscle, um, first, mm-hmm. first of all, something very important to do if you want to do so. Um, but it's a, uh, um, but to definitely have a treatment um, it, because you because I need a synopsis. If you were going to hand this to me and I have ten minutes to look at it, what do you want me to know? And it's not going to be that I ha- and I don't in ten minutes. I'm not going to read your three hundred page book. I just don't have the time. Uh, you know, so um, a good, you know, these are the types of characters. This is the world. This is uh, mm. what I'm trying to do with this. Uh, something along the uh, the line of the eye of where you see it going. So whether or not you have a big world one book, or whether you see it as a series of five thousand, allow the person who's reading the work, hopefully if they're actually good, to see where your world can go. Because sometimes okay. your world can go in completely different directions that you would never. Um, never think of um that someone could take that someone could take it or they could say i just don't get it you know or Mm -hmm. how is this any different from x or whatever and you need to be able to answer those questions um you don't necessarily need to but writing a treatment is helpful writing an excellent log line a log line is simply one or two sentences that literally tells me everything i need to know about the book that makes me want to uh, read more um so if you can summarize your work in two sentences and make somebody want to read it, that's a pretty good start. 
That would be an excellent. If we could do that, we'd be probably all selling tons of books. So it's something we should work on no matter what. It's good exactly. to have. <laughs> well, apparently that's what I'm currently doing for page turners. So I get to get uh, pitched by several people tomorrow in, a, in my next webinar. So anyway, so that the first thing I taught in the first session was how to write a good log line. And again, you can write a lot. You can look that up on the net. It's not, this mm-hmm. isn't confidential information, but being able to actually sit down and do it. Um, and then my other piece of advice, if you truly want to write screenplays and you're not certain about condensing your book is find your favorite TV show, uh, break it down, which is basically list out, you know, list your favorite episode and list the, you know, the best, the scene and what's going on in the scenes and then write your favorite, write a spec script of your favorite TV show. And that will be very difficult very quickly when you realize how difficult that is. If you can find a script (laughs) of it online, uh, Uh you can see how uh, how uh, shows are broken down. Um, Learning the again, it's learning your craft. So learning the structure. Is it a three act structure? If it's a sitcom, it's normally it's normally three acts, but it's two two storylines, A and B storyline. In hour long, it's A, B, and C storylines. Or for that matter, uh, if you wanted to write a screenplay, um, then go rewrite a screenplay. Go, you know, go rewrite The Godfather. See, see how it was broken <laughs> down. Really do your research. Uh, you know, books are about research. So um, yeah. you have to study your craft and you don't necessarily need to go to film school to do it. Um, but there are writing is writing and it's, it's not... Um, uh, but that's very helpful for you to get into the mindset of what people are also looking for from a script standpoint. Yeah, I'm sure it is. It would really help you if you want to do this. It would probably give you that edge of knowing, you know, what how to do the writing and what has historically been done and how you put that into production and sort of the way you've immersed yourself into it all these years. You know so much more that, you know, the things that you've probably forgotten are more than most people just trying to get into this even realize. So that sure, would be really yeah. interesting. Well, just, just, and just I, writing your book is only the first step. I hate to tell you, I wish you, I wish <laughs> I could say that it wasn't, but basically you writing your book is literally step number one of about, you know, I, and I don't try to discourage anybody, but uh, the farther along you can get yourself before you get in front of somebody to pitch or uh, get that break, you know, that you've been waiting for, for however long and in ha- whatever form um, will put you so much farther ahead than just someone who's like, I wrote a great book. You should read it. I don't know why it's not a TV show. It's like, well, with an attitude like that, I'm immediately going to tell you no. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. That just makes so, sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's appreciating that it is a lot of hard work and putting that effort in so that you're you're also ready for that success when it comes. You know, I always think it helps to have a few books under your belt and maybe a platform built before you do hit that stratosphere, because then you're going to have more to support you and you're not going to be maybe a one shot wonder or something. I'd rather have this right. as a long term career. <laughs> Yeah, well, I actually worked with a uh, a group um, briefly that they had created, speaking of fantasy, they had created uh-huh. a podcast and they are on Patreon. And I can't, to be honest with you, I can't remember the name because this is a couple of years ago. But they, I had a friend of mine who was a big fan of their podcast. It was pretty popular on from Patreon standpoints. Um, and it was a t- it was basically Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but oh, it was, cool. they had created some very... Um, very good characters within the world of Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons is a different ball game because it's, it's really more of an overarching thing. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. like, Oh, you have to get the rights to Dungeons and Dragons. However, I would double check that, but basically <laughs> works exist, et cetera, et cetera, in other worlds. But uh, they had a whole storyline and they would do these three hour podcasts. Oh, um, right. And so they, you know, and they, they were for a couple of years. So they had a ton of material and I'm like, okay, well, this is really great. But The first thing we need to do is figure out, you know, who the characters are in their world. And also I need some, I can't do three years worth of podcasts in a movie. (laughs) So we need to come up with a storyline, et cetera, et cetera. But the, but the thing that was interesting that it fell apart was, is that each of the people who contributed, so there were like four or five of them, um, they were doing this just kind of for fun. Uh, but then when something like this actually came along and there was some interest, suddenly they were all infighting with each other about who owned what, oh. uh, who owned, you know, which character, who had created sort of the overarching world, et cetera, et cetera. At which point, you know, if you're going to go to anybody in the industry, they're going to want you to have that buttoned up because I'm not, it's not my job to figure out, 
you know, between the five of you who owns the rights to all of this stuff. And so they ended up infighting and I don't even think they do the podcast anymore. So oh, you're, no. um, you know, so it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you actually had the opportunity. You were not prepared for the opportunity. So, you know, so again, it's like you said, it's not just a matter of being a good writer. It's also understanding all everything that goes into when the opportunity comes, are you actually prepared for it? Whether it be success or whether it be more hard work or whether it be some schmo like me basically saying, this is really great, but, you know, can we change this orc to a fluffy rabbit? And then, you know, maybe (laughs) the orc is supposed to be a fluffy rabbit, or maybe you go, no, it's not a fluffy rabbit, it's an orc, and and in which case you move on to the next executive. So, yeah. No, that sounds interesting. And I, one thing that it caught my attention too is you had mentioned before that the movie studios seem to be, I mean, it definitely seems like they're just doing remakes of well written Avatar 2 and the whole Marvel series, everything's sort of stuff that has been tried and true and they know it's going to be worth the budget. So, do you think if you write in something that's more cutting edge, would that then? push you to look more at Netflix or HBO or do you think you could try to sell that to movies or do you think most indie authors are better at looking at like the TV series? Um, you know what? I, I'm a big fan of TV series mainly because I think that there's more room for story. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the, the my biggest concern about films right now, although I actually just heard a very interesting story in NPR yesterday because of COVID uh, right now, uh, uh blockbusters are dead um, mainly because they can't, they currently can't be made and they really need a massive, uh, uh, you know, box office presence in order to make their money back mm-hmm. or to make money. And so, and, and that was, that's been a case for, that's been a case for the, a while, but now even more so in the time of COVID um, they just pulled the latest James Bond movie and they're pushing it till next year because people can't get into theaters. And so, uh, and they're literally the, the largest theater chain in the world is now closing down all of their theaters until next year, oh, um, with oh a few goodness. exceptions. So, um, so one thing about TV that's great right now, and, and you can make film for TV, but content right now with regards to large blockbuster, while they are preparing for the end of COVID and the resumption of production, um, stuff starting to go towards smaller fare now towards indie fare, mm-hmm. but something that you can actually stick on a Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with regards to actually pitching to Netflix, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, Netflix is an interesting organization and like all streaming services, they've got a lot of competition, but Netflix's model uh, is to actually cancel series after two or three se- uh, seasons maximum. Uh, unless oh, wow. it's massively popular. And they do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's about cost. So in the industry, uh, when something starts becoming successful, the people that are attached to it, the actors, et cetera, et cetera, start getting paid more money. Um, right. The second thing is, is, and so once it starts becoming successful, the cost of production goes up. Um, the second thing is, is uh, the Netflix likes to keep it fresh. So I'm actually sit- looking at my next Netflix page right now. I don't have time to do much of anything, let alone constantly be on Netflix. I wish I, I wish I did. Um, and, uh, you know, but they're, they're, they're interested in refreshing their content over and over. And also if you have something that's, uh, you get on Netflix, that doesn't necessarily mean immediate success in the sense that sometimes it's either too niche or, uh, you're not getting enough viewers based on what their algorithm is. So, and nobody knows what their algorithm is because if you knew that they'd have to kill you. So they don't, you know, no. but there have been uh, successful shows. There was one show I want to say out of Norway um, that figured out the you know, social media channels and that type of thing. I believe it was a fantasy show. I believe it was about Vikings or something where they cracked kind of the Netflix algorithm to get enough people to watch it and enough sort of buzz around social media and stuff where, they managed to get a couple more seasons out of it as opposed to Netflix was going to cancel it after one season. So um, there's a lot of different things to do. So, Hey, go for the Netflix thing if you can, (laughs) but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Netflix the panacea of, Oh my God, if I get it on Netflix, I've arrived because I think that there's other ways uh, there's other uh, platforms, but also um, you're most likely not, uh, not going to be able to pitch directly to Netflix anyways, uh, because they're very, because everybody wants to. You know, so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
And is this something that, you know, author, is this just something like when you do book publishing, you need an agent and you do this and that? Or is it something that literally if you're a single person and you're just determined to take this route and do the work and learn the stuff, you can do it on your own? Or do you, is it really helpful to go get an agent and ha- let them do the hard work? Sure. So again, the disappointing answer, unfortunately, to everybody um, is yes. Uh, to both the team, <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, I have... I have an agent right now that's a, uh, that's specifically um, for children's media. And um, I know these people, I do a lot of corporate work for Mattel toys. So Mm -hmm. I, you know, so I know these people um, and work in these areas and they, you know, I just had a bit of a disappointment with the magic poop because just of timing. And so they're very much in my corner in a very small agency. uh, And, but they're still, you know, pushing, um, but still I have to do a ton of work on my own so much so that I, I just signed another, um, uh, another first look deal with another woman who's a producer who might be more likely to get it, to get it going. Um, and I also have, uh, of all people, Keanu Reeves' sister looking at it. So she has her own production oh, company. So, but it's actually. still a matter of, yeah, but I'm, st- I myself personally, am still pounding the pavement. That doesn't make me any more special than any of your listeners. That just makes me as someone who's pounded the pavement. So I think with regards yeah. to agents, um, you're going to find that. Uh, and then I have friends who are Emmy award winning screenwriters who have agents um, who, um, who can't get their agent to call them back. So oh. I think having an, having an agent is to me, it's almost like a, um, it's almost like saying, uh, you know, I have a cool, you know, I have a magic potion in my closet, which is, it gives you more street cred, but ultimately doing it on your own isn't, is, is mainly what you're going to do anyways. And if you're talking about traditional publishing, even more so, um, traditional publishers are really, uh, it's really difficult to break in traditional publishing wise. Um, and so I think if you can get an agent as a self-published person, that's fantastic, but you're also going to need to do a lot of the um, legwork yourself. I mean, if you can get one, great, because it's always great to have contacts. But um, my thought process is also uh, uh, think of non-traditional avenues towards getting your work out there. So, mm-hmm. for example, my book, The Magic Poop, is about a little African-American girl with, uh, with magic hair. Uh, and I spent a lot of time going to African American hair shows. I am not African American, nor do I have African American hair. Although probably have more knowledge about it than most people who actually are African American at this point. Um, but yeah, I was the only male uh, and the only um, Caucasian person at African American hair shows for several years. And people would come up to me and go, "Why the hell are you here?" And I would, think, <laughs> you know, and it's only after they see the work that they got got it but that was a non-traditional way of getting my work out there that would that I don't that most people wouldn't do so if you have something that's got some sort of twist or if you have something that uh, um, it's difficult with fantasy in general depending on what you but there are non-traditional ways of getting your stuff out there um, you know and some people pound the pavement some people go to comic-con and literally oh, just yeah. standing outside and they're handing out comic they're hang, handing out comic books to people you know or or that oh, type yeah. of thing um because you just don't know you don't know who you're going to meet but also you don't know how you're going to create a fandom um it really is up to you to create your own fandom um even though uh there are other ways you know there's agents and that type of thing yeah i think one of the most honest posts um internet things i'd ever read on even marketing was like what I did was I wrote down 10 ideas every day and I would try them. I'd cross them off and eventually one of them worked. And that's how I got to where I am today. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah that pretty much sums up how it really does work. It's not follow these exact steps and they will work for you. It is come no, up with a yeah. crap load of them and one of them will eventually work for you. <laughs> there is there is absolutely no spoon. There there really isn't. Yeah. There is no spoon to quote the Matrix. Uh, there's a... There's a steps you can take and there are things you can do uh to better prepare yourself for success or to create more success um but at the same time there's uh it's a lot of trial and error based on exactly um you know exactly what you're creating uh and if you truly love what you're creating and you're doing it for you um then none of that stuff will make a difference ultimately ultimately it'll find its audience one way or another um 
to pay what you do. And, and it's also cyclical with regards to trends in the industry. I mean, for the mm. longest time, uh, you know, back, I don't know how many years now, I'm probably dating myself, but whenever Twilight was popular, which of course, oh, you know, yes. uh, not, trust me, I saw the first movie of Twilight and I'm not a huge fan of it, but I know it was a huge thing. And then if you'll notice in Hollywood after Twilight happened, it got about 30 vampire spinoffs, uh, you, <laughs> yes. know, in, you know, mostly in the young adult space, uh, in the tween space. Um, but, you know, but now vampires aren't dead, but now she's coming out with a new thing. And I, I get the feeling vampires will be hot again, you know. So um, it's just a, it's a uh, knowing the industry and knowing where things are going uh, right mm-hmm. now. I think people have been looking for the next Game of Thrones for like since Game of Thrones ended, you know, and you have right. something like The Witcher, uh, which is on Netflix. Um, and then, uh, then you have weird sort of hybrid things like Stranger Things, um, and, and sort of everything in between. But you also have something called uh, that's called Enola Holmes, which is basically, you know, a take oh, yes. on Sherlock Holmes with with I his daughter. I have seen that one recently. You know? Yes, yeah, which is uh, which is very sweet. And but it's also it, but it's also a you're still taking a genre. You know, you're taking Sherlock Holmes, which has been around since you know the 1800s, uh, and you're um, you're putting a new twist on it, you know? Um, and so that there's all these different ways of doing it. It just depends on what you're writing. Um, my thought process, because I'm happy, you know, because I enjoy diversity and that type of thing is, um, tell me how your story is different from everything else while at the same time, how I can relate to it based on, you know, stuff that I like. You know, and so yeah, that's the tropes not or the world or characters, mm-hmm. right? Right, exactly. And if you have another take on Star Trek, um, that's cool, but that's uh, you're not going to get that made at the moment because they just canceled all the movies. So you know, oh. they're 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 <laughs> going back into television shows. So it's 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 a it's a line. It's it's a line. It's a um, but it's a fun one because if you're really into genre um, and there's certain genres that you really like and crossover and that type of thing. Um, there is definitely a market for it. It's just a question of, you know, what it is and where, and where you want to take it. Oh, it sounds, that's really cool. Just out of curiosity, is there anything like um, the small vanity publishers that are, you know, pay us a whole bunch of money and we'll go and we'll, we'll produce your book for you. I mean, do publishing, do any of these publishers and do they ever, or production companies come and actually approach other people? I mean, if someone did that, do you run screaming? Um, or I, is this just yes. not out there yet? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, I think, so there's a lot of companies that offer that. Um, I, okay. had I had self-published through um, a company called Ex Libris, which is actually an imprint of Penguin Publishing. Um, yeah. They're actually were bought by Penguin. Um and I did that whole route. So I'll be the first one to say that I spent more than my own fair share of my own money on those things. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't see a lot of value in them because 95% of the time they'll blow a lot of, I mean, uh, I attended a conference about that and, oh, you're going to make your show into a movie. And this is before I knew everything that I knew, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I made some good contacts, but I wouldn't say, I would say I spent a lot of money and there's a lot of people there who just frankly shouldn't be there in the sense that Mm -hmm. uh, people that are writers or whatever, who aren't necessarily professionals who are trying to, um, who are trying to get into the dream, if you will, without Mm -hmm. understanding the process. So I'm, I'm not completely against doing that, but I think if you're going to spend the money on something like that, like a conference or something like that, I absolutely think pitch fests are great. Um, mm. Not necessarily because you're going to get picked up tomorrow, but because it gives you the experience and what pitching actually is. That and also sense. you'll be amazed at the people you meet out there who have similar stories to yours, or you'll get inspired by, you know, somebody else's book or whatever. And so I think, um, you know, getting picked up at a pitch fest is probably much less likely than they would want you to believe, but I would encourage people to do it, not necessarily for, um, to, to make that happen, but more along the lines of to meet people, to network because networking is key and to, and to understand the process because I can talk about pitching all day. Uh, but, uh, until you're actually sitting in front of somebody who, uh, literally hears 30 pitches a day or however many they pitch before lunch, um, and is trying to do all of the different things. Um, 
it's a, it's a nerve wracking thing and you need that. You need, you know, you need to understand that you have my attention for approximately 30 seconds, even though I told you it's three minutes. So wow. if you can pitch me in 30 seconds or, or more likely in about 10, uh, that I'm actually willing to listen to everything else you have to say, that's a really good skill set um, because it also helps you with your writing. No, I think yeah, it's it's literally getting involved and enmeshed and immersed in it and honing your skill, and that's so important. And you're also making me feel so good that I got you to come on the podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> sure, <laughs> you never know when you send that email, so I'm so appreciate it. Oh, sure. before we go, I know we've been doing this for a while, but I love, like I mentioned, I'm really into diversity. I think fantasy is is always had these trends of embracing diversity. I mean, for a while we were what Conan the Barbarian, but since then, sure, modern day fantasy is beautiful. And I, like I've mentioned, I love the pictures on your website the magic poof and i mean i read that how you came up with it you were working on a loved one's hair and you came up with this idea of this magic hair and all the things a little heroine gets into it's just so much fun so do you think that's that is a strong trend of fantasy is that one of the brilliant things about it and do you think um i know there's a current trend of like appropriation do you ever worry sure that someone is going to come up to you and say well why did you write this but it sounds like sure. you've had that experience and you have a good answer. Yeah, um, I think I think it's always a so my thing has always been I am very aware of the uh, the need for diversity in character, um, but also mm-hmm. the need to understand other people's stories. My thing is, is that as someone who's sort of a, you know, I'm, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm kind of a traditional white guy, but I'm really not a traditional white guy. My, you know, my grandmother's from Mexico, so we used to have tamales at, uh, you know, we used to have tamales at Christmas. So, you know, everyone else has ham, and we had tamales, and it was just kind of like, it didn't really make that much difference to me. But Phoenix, for the most part, up until now, when I was a little kid, was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty white. Um, my thing is, is that if you're going to write diversity and you're not necessarily considered I, my thing is, is that everybody's different, right? So the, the theme of my books is everybody feels different. So regardless, right. so uh, I've always felt different because I'm a, I'm uh, not a very large person. I'm kind of a, you know, I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I'm kind of a short, skinny, geeky dude, you know? Um, and so I'm, you know, so it's one of those things where I always felt different in my own skin right. for many different reasons. And so I came at it from that, standpoint because uh-huh. I can't talk about your experience as an African American person growing up in inner city, city Detroit because it's not my experience. If you want to write about somebody like that, then my suggestion is is that you actually talk to somebody um mm-hmm. talk to somebody about that. But what I would say about diversity is first of all fantasy and sci-fi have always been, you know, uh, great uh um vehicles for telling diverse stories that are a wink and a nod to, you know, current cultural issues. You know, I mean, you can go back to, you know, episodes of, again, I'm dating myself, but Star Trek The Next Generation, where they're literally oh, talking sorry. about same-sex marriage, you know, but they're not talking about same-sex marriage. Right. Uh, you know, there it's, it's an episode. So I think it's a little bit more blatant now. Um, and there's a mm-hmm. lot of opportunity for story. But my suggestion is, is um, include diversity, but don't assume that you – Tell it from the perspective of this is um, a character who's African American, but they're African, but they're not a token African American person. Or you're trying to pretend like you grew up in inner city Chicago because you didn't. Um, there, there's everybody has all characters have. There's there's a much deeper thing going on with with human beings, especially in the current time of COVID. Um, nice. That's. Uh, that affects everybody and it may affect everybody differently, but there are still universal human truths that make sense uh, to people that come out in characters. And then you overlay on top of that, the sort of diversity angle, if you will, or the idea that we also need to take into account these people's backgrounds. So if I were going to write a show about, I actually do have a script about um, it's called the X, the expatriate. And it's about uh, a, well, it's really not in these current times. It's probably not that untimely, but basically, someone who was born in the United States who then gets, based on new laws, gets repatriated to Brazil. Um, oh, and so, wow. it's a Brazilian, an American 
repatriated to a place he's never known. So again, it's just, it's a fish out of water story. Um, but at the same time, there's a very real aspect of sending somebody to a completely different culture um, and them not knowing it, even though the color of their skin dictates that they're part of a culture. So I think um, if you're going to do that type of thing, do your research, um, partner up with people who have more background and information on it than you do, but also make it much more in depth than I'm some, you know, what, whatever their background is. It's like John was, a, you know, was actually raised on a Lakota Indian reservation, you know, and it's like, that's a really nice surface piece. But I don't really, but how does that affect John's overall view of the world? That's what I'm right. interested in. I'm not interested yeah. in just the fact that we've laid on a background of a character and the assumption that the audience then goes, oh, well, if he was raised on a Lakota reservation, then obviously he must be some sort of spiritual shaman type because he was <sighs> raised with American, you know, with Native Americans. It's like, no, I want to see if you're going to, if you're going to do diversity, which I think is totally needed, um, then do it in a way that transcends just surface level cultural norms. Um, right. Or those so stereotypes that, you can tell that or stereotypes. Yeah, exactly. yeah the Native so American, I, always a wise shaman is, yeah, it's been done. We can move on. Right, exactly. So, in other words, in, in my, you know, in my book series, yeah. in The Magic Who, for example, the little girl is me. The li- and, and it's not that she, she feels different because she's got magic hair, but she also feels different because of the somewhat of because of the color of her skin, but mainly yeah. it's because she feels different because of who she is. And so, cause right. I can't speak to the color of her skin based on that. I can make reference mm-hmm. to it in, in a way that is, is helpful for people to understand, but really the, the, the element is about being feeling different. And I can yeah. feel that way because, because as a, you know, I can understand bullying because I was bullied when I was little. I can understand right. feeling different because I felt different when I was little. You know, that type of thing, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. I love that because it brought up that idea of the iceberg. I mean, what people see on the surface, especially I feel I think we could, we could still have lunch together. But yeah, I just what people see when they look at me, I always find so hilarious because it's not who I internally see myself or all the depths of me. It's that iceberg tip. People see that little iceberg and they're thinking this is what you are. And for I think a lot of people who love the fantasy and sci-fi genre, it's not even close. It's just the surface. Right. And, and my thought process is also, again, if people are going to be writing about diversity, then you have to either partner up with, with those that are diverse uh, right. or, you know, do your research. And I was very careful. You know, you mentioned mm-hmm. cultural appropriation. Um, no, I love very, that you went to these shows. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's like I, you know, I didn't just sort of sit around and go, I think I'm going to write a little about a little African-American girl. I wrote oh. I did that. And then I. um uh, you know, I know one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter and, you know, uh, vetted it with academics and, you know, and it's, that doesn't make me, you know, that doesn't make me a hero of, you know, African-American people by any stretch of the imagination. But the point was, was simply for me to understand, you know, I, I learned so much about culture that I didn't necessarily know based on my own background. And it was important to know that because mm-hmm. when that question gets thrown to you, you have an answer as opposed to, Oh, well, I just put in, you know, whatever, an African American character, an Asian character, or, um, you know, or whatever. It's like, great, write a manga comment. That's really, really cool. Uh, but if you're not Japanese and you're not full and you're not fully versed in the culture, um, then you should probably talk to some people and get an understanding as to why manga is so important in Japanese culture. Um, and there's a reason why it's important in Japanese culture. Japanese culture is traditionally much more, uh, you know, much more um, staid and less public with their emotions. Manga is a way for people to express their emotions in a way they wouldn't normally do in a society that is considered much more buttoned up, if you will. Um, that's changing now with with generations. But you know, if you look at some manga stuff, like some that some of that stuff is pretty intense. You know, yes. and there's so it's a, it's a very immersing yourself in the culture of what you're writing. Uh, and employing allies in that culture, I think, is critical if you if you want to hit the diversity angle. Um, but also, there's diversity in whatever it is in your own background. You know, so again, like I said, my paternal grandmother's from Mexico. We didn't really discuss it that much. It wasn't really that big of a thing. But it's like having tamales at Christmas, and you know, my dad trying to teach me Spanish when we were little, and me going, I don't understand why I need to know Spanish. You know, and it's like now, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't know it, but. 
Um, oh. Just really, you know, finding the diversity in your own culture speaks to in your own background. It doesn't even have to be cultural. Um, is is a thread that weaves through any story that works for everybody, not just for um, you know one specific person. It's about the story and the characters, and less and the the cultural influences are an overlay uh, to uh, your people, yeah, in your stories. That that makes total sense, and I love that it. it's very beautiful, and it does make sense. I mean, we should all have at least a if it's not authentic that it's who we are, then it's at least authentic to that. We did the, we did the, got the street cred. We went and did the research. We talked to the real people. We had them look at it and we weren't trying to hide it or, or stand, you know, bury it somewhere. Sure. Exactly. I I mean, so, so, I mean, a good example would be someone like if there was a person who was close to Martin Luther King Jr. Who was white and, you know, wrote a screenplay or a book or something Well, more than like, even though they were white, if they were traveling around with Martin Luther King Jr. and actually knew the guy, I would be much more likely to read their script as opposed to someone who's like, who an African-American person was like, oh, I wrote a story about Martin Luther King Jr. It's like, well, but this guy has more, you know, this person actually knew him, you know, like I want to know who the person is. So this person, in my opinion, has more experience. Now you you might hit up somebody who's an executive who would be like, uh, because there's backlash, of course, uh, and you have to be right. mindful of it without being negative about it, but you have to be mindful of it that there can be a backlash. And it's like, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't I don't know. Am I the only person who can write a story about short, skinny white guys? Probably not. But I bet you there's <laughs> an African-American guy who's a short, skinny African-American guy who's a nerd who grew up in a completely different city who's more like me than, you know, half the people I grew up with, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get that. I do get that. That is awesome. Well, thank you. I don't want to keep you forever. I know you're a busy guy. So I will wrap this up and just say thank you so much for your time. It was especially for me that's coming. I watch like maybe one show a night. I am not a big movie buff either. Though a lot of the ones you mentioned, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I did watch that one. So it was really interesting to hear that this is, you know, how you would go about starting to do this. And I would know if I went down this route, I would have so much work to do. But that's okay. At least I would walk in knowledgeable. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, if you come out on the other side, having done all the work, that means you're actually meant to be doing it. Otherwise, that's, that's... you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a labor of love, let's put it that way. <laughs> well, I look forward to hearing that, you know, the Magic Poof has made it into its animated series or whatever, however it comes out and all the other projects you're working on. I think it sounds fascinating. And I definitely think the world needs the voice that you've created. So thank you. And thank you again for your time today. Thanks so much. I very much appreciate it. So next week, yes, we'll be back and we're going to be talking about finding an author voice and what it is. If you like what you just heard, there's a few things you can do to support the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. Please tell a fellow author about the show and visit us at Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. You can also join Autumn and Jasper on Patreon.com slash AmWritingFantasy. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll get awesome rewards and keep the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast going. Stay safe out there and see you next Monday. <laughs>